I'm not really surprised, but I'm disappointed. I guess that's like common for me. Hey guys, this is Jules with True Crime Reactions. Now again, we have some new documents. And as I posted in the community tab, it's about the cameras. Now we don't have a hearing for the cameras. I'm not just going to splurt the date out verbally because I might not be remembering correctly. So it'll be on the screen here. But we haven't even had the motion for this yet. We were supposed to hear about this last Friday on the 1st of September and then everything that they had sat down and scheduled out for the next, you know, couple of months until trial just blew up. Actually, what month? Because, oh, wow. Next month is October. This year has gone by extremely fast. The defense, their whole, like, thing when it comes to the cameras in the first place, to me, it's not even really the cameras themselves. It's more like the immaturity of the public because of the fly thing and all the stuff. You guys know what's going on. You guys are living it. Like we're all living this right now. We know exactly what they're talking about. But to me, that's a very immature argument in itself. Like to be complaining about the immaturity of the public when it comes to something this serious and making that your freaking argument is immature in itself to me. And the state is like agreeing with the defense on the cameras but they their argument makes more sense and honestly the defense might have mentioned the witnesses in their argument the document just started to feel real pointless like i don't remember every little detail of it so again they could have mentioned the fact that you know the cameras could be a hindrance to the witnesses they could have but the state is making that their entire argument. And I, I, I hate these catch 22 feelings, right? Because I want cameras. I believe in transparent justice and there's no reason. There's no reason why in 2023, this whole camera situation in every single court ever has not already been alleviated and handled. I'm not really quite sure if the state actually means what they're saying in this document. Because you know how we feel about what's going on with the evidence sharing. So when they talk about the witnesses in this document, they're acting like it's because they actually care about them. And they could, you know, they could. But with everything that we've seen so far and the way that we saw them attack, and that's what it was, it was an attack on Gabriella Vargas when she came up on the stand and gave honest testimony, because that's what it was. It was honest testimony of things that she's experienced and seen and had been knowledgeable about since she put herself in the field that she's in. Like we saw the way they treated them, her, we saw the way that the state treated her. So I don't know. Okay, let's just, let's go over these documents real quick. Now you guys know I have to go in chronological order. So we're going to have to go through two more little documents real quick before we get to the camera one. Now we went over the state's intent to not cross-examine not only Leah Larkin, but Gabriella Vargas. And again, after we go through these documents, like the specific document, and I read to you the state's reasoning. I want you guys to tell me if I'm overthinking, overreaching the way that I'm feeling about their sincerity in this document based on what we saw them do with Gabriella Vargas. Because what they did to her would have happened with or without cameras. But without cameras, the public wouldn't know what the state did to her by sending the FBI to basically go interrogate her about the information that she 
testified about how there's things that law enforcement does that's illegal. If there was no cameras, we wouldn't know that. If there was no media, we wouldn't know that. So I don't know. Okay, let's just go ahead and yeah. So this first one is a motion to temporary seal. This is because the state has responded to something when it comes to the defendant's seventh supplemental request for discovery. Now I pulled that document up earlier and I have the codes already open over here, but we're going to be looking at ICR 16 B one through eight. Now I'm going to make this bigger so you guys can see that that's what that says. Cause there's something in this that kind of throws me and I want you guys to see that this isn't like one and eight. Okay. This is one dash 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 meaning one including everything in between one and eight okay so let's just and i think i've heard people talk about this before and i don't know i'm eh. okay so this is idaho criminal rule 16 and it is all about discovery and inspection i'm not going to read every little bitty thing here i don't have the time i've got to clock into work in like 30 ish minutes i've got to get this like done done i'm gonna have the link for this though in the description box for those of you that want to go in and read all of this stuff okay but we're gonna focus on what this says right here b one dash through everything in between until eight okay i made it a little bit bigger okay now again this is idaho rule 16 Disclosure of evidence and materials by the prosecution on written request. Okay, now we're going to go one through eight. One, statement of defendant. Two, statement of a co-defendant. Three, defendant's prior record. Four, documents and tangible objects. Five, reports of examinations and tests, states, witnesses, expert witnesses, and the last one is police reports. They stopped before getting to number nine, which is digital media, but they made no insignias whatsoever right here to say one and three through eight. Okay. They left in statement of a co-defendant. Yeah. But anyway, whatever the state has responded to is under seal. Like I, I figured it would be, there'd be no reason for it not to be under seal. Honestly, that makes the most sense. Okay. And this is the state's full response with everything being under seal. And all it says is the basic mumbo jumbo about, you know, these are the titles of all of the defendants requests for discovery and the state has and will continue to provide discovery in accordance with Idaho criminal rule 16 and applicable law and reserves any and all objections there under. This is everything the defense is asking for, and this is everything that we have and will continue to provide answers for. We've seen this document a million times. Now let's go ahead and move on to the camera document. This is the state responding to the motion for the cameras to be removed from the courtroom from the defense, and this is them agreeing with them. Okay, so comes now the state of Idaho by and through the Latel County prosecuting attorney and respectfully submits the following response to the defendant's motion to remove cameras from the courtroom filed on August 24th. As the court and parties, including interveners, are aware, this case has and continues to attract significant public and media attention involving not only traditional media, but also a broad range of social media related posting, blogs, podcasts, and other disseminations, etc. 
This case also involves significant physical and emotional components, not only by virtue of the nature of the unalivings themselves, but also by the myriad of circumstances surrounding the victims, their associates, friends, family, the residents at 1122 King Road, and so forth. This case will necessarily involve not only evidence of a graphic nature, but also testimony from a number of young and vulnerable witnesses. I mean, that's not a lie. It's not a lie. These include the surviving roommates of Madison Mogan, Kaylee Gonzalez, Ethan Chapin, and Zana Kernodal, which we already knew. And I don't know. It's very just kind of strange the way that they've kind of played this to the public. It's almost as if they wanted there to be like a Dylan versus Bethany situation, because the only thing that the public has heard is that, you know, all of Dylan's recollections are in the PCA for arrest. But then the defense comes out saying, oh, the other surviving roommate, Bethany, has information that can exonerate Brian Koberger. So it's like they just pitted the two survivors against each other, like for drama points honestly like if you really think about it and really think about it it's it's pretty gross it's a it's pretty gross in addition to and at least partially as a result of the substantial traditional and social media coverage certain witnesses have already been subjected to threats and harassment including physical intrusions directed at not only the witnesses and other university co-eds but their extended families and friends and all of that is true see there's a lot of channels here on YouTube that feel the need to like do more and do unnecessary things. Like I know that I went over a couple of things when it came to Emma Bailey because she was at the house and there was like a whole bunch of weird stuff going on there. And she was mentioned a couple of times on this channel in a couple of videos, just in passing. And we went through like the, DUI video. Okay. That's public information. Everything that we went through on here was public. And I think I literally did one video on the girl just because of the strange coincidences, because I like to think out loud, but there's channels and you guys will know exactly like you'll literally see images of the videos that you've watched with this crap in your brain. As I'm saying this, there's channels that go and dig into all of these people's lives and basically just dox them all over the place. Just because they might have had some sort of connection to somebody involved in the case, suddenly their lives are being dissected and now the whole world knows all their business and they have no idea what's going on. So this isn't wrong. But then again, the internet just made it faster and more ridiculous because back in the day before the internet, that still happened but it was happening like in your face. People were constantly coming to your house. They were calling your phone. They were trying to follow you anywhere you were going. It was like, it was like physical in your face type situations. It wasn't so much like on the internet. It was newspapers. It was the media stations. Then the internet just made it to where kind of like everyone in the public can kind of get involved with it. It's not just like certain groups and organizations are, people with certain agendas, it's, it's pretty much everyone. But there's channels that have gone way too far. Bringing up names that don't even make any sense just because of a work relation or a slight family relation. And all of a sudden that person's life just, I just start seeing their name and their face like on, you know, all these channels that just like copy each other on their crap. And it's, it's gross. So, I mean, I do agree with this. I agree with this. I've seen it. We've all seen it. So as of this point, there's literally nothing in this I can argue with. There's not. The state fully understands the enormous value that responsible media has in helping the public to understand the true facts of what occurs in court. The state believes, however, that those ends can be accomplished without the need for camera video images or the physical presence of cameras in the courtroom. Based on the above, the state is concerned that allowing the presence of cameras in the courtroom will have a substantial chilling effect on the ability of witnesses to openly, fully, and candidly testify about some horrible occurrences. In addition, the state has a responsibility to take steps to ensure a fair trial for all involved. 
Judge Boyce's decision in Vallo Daybell attached to the state's June 6, 2023 brief on video and photographic coverage provides a thorough examination of the issues before the court. The state reiterates those same concerns, including the issue of jurors accessing the broadcast and seeing evidence which has not been put in front of them and witnesses potentially viewing the broadcasted testimony of prior witnesses. The state respectfully submits that the appropriate course of action would be for the court to prohibit cameras in the courtroom, both still and video. At a minimum during trial and during any other court proceedings at which victims such as described above might be called to testify. Yeah. And that's my problem with this, guys, is that I agree with their argument. I do. I can imagine, like, regardless of what the truth of everything ends up being here, okay, because we, you guys, we still have a huge eight hour gap that needs to be answered for, severely answered for. And I can imagine that Ann Taylor is not going to be light on Dylan or Bethany. The defense are going to tried to eat them alive. So I can imagine that it's already going to be really like difficult anyway. Like it's, it's already a horrible situation, a horrible feeling that you, you can't even really imagine unless you've like, even me. Okay. I've, I've been in a courtroom as a victim But I cannot, I can't even fathom the magnitude of this feeling. Because whenever you're in a situation like like mine, there's a couple of people kind of scattered because they're there for their own cases and no one's really paying attention. And you go in front of the judge and it's just you and your attorney and the judge and someone that's, you know, the transcriber, the court recorder. And it's not like an all eyes on you situation. It's very just four people, 20 minutes, and it's done. All eyes are on you in this situation. Everyone is there for the same thing, not for their own thing. Everyone is there for the same thing. And the rooms are packed. And you're surrounded by strangers, but also by people that you know. But all eyes are on you. And you have to remember exactly everything And you have to be prepared for whatever they're going to like throw at you question wise because you can't you can't lie you have to be as honest as you possibly can be and the problem is the honesty that we're going to actually get on the stand here because that eight hours is a big deal especially with some of the things that i've been told in the background, if, if any of those things happen to be valid, then yeah, that eight hours is a huge deal. And if what we're sort of getting from some of the victim's family's statements or really, you know, Kaylee's mom's recollection of everything that she had been told from the people that were there, with Ethan's body being found up against the door, a shut door, and them having to get the door open and having to call Hunter over over to help them open the door because something was blocking it and it was Ethan. Time could have mattered. I mean, it mattered. I don't care what anyone says. The timing mattered. And there's too many things about that eight hours. I just don't know. I don't know how I feel about this because the state's not wrong with their argument. They actually played this very well, honestly. I don't know. Okay. Let's just see. Let's see what this last document says. Order temporary ceiling exhibit. Okay. So it's nothing. (laughs) Just, yeah, it's nothing. It's just them for the seventh supplemental request for discovery. 
the state's response is being sealed, which is, you know, it's basically the exact same thing that we looked at prior. But yeah, so that's it. There's nothing else. But you see how I feel like I know that you guys can f- tell that I feel like I don't know how to think. Because I really, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the, the, the state's argument on the cameras is a million times better and more valid than the defenses. But let me know what you guys think, because right now I just don't know which, which way to go here. Like, I still want cameras. I believe cameras are necessary with everything that we've seen up to date. But they're not wrong. Let me know. See y'all.